good morning, everyone. Good morning to be at church. Worship the Lord. It's Palm Sunday. I love Palm Sunday. I do. I don't know. I think a lot of times we miss the significance of Palm Sunday because Palm Sunday is really a good time for us all to check in our own hearts what we're looking for. Because Palm Sunday was a day when people, Jesus came into Jerusalem and they proclaimed him king. They thought he was going to be a certain kind of savior and he didn't end up being the kind of savior they thought he was going to be. And because of that, many people six days later were yelling crucify him. So I always think Palm Sunday is a good tune-up Sunday for me. It always just makes me just think about my relationship with God, think about my attitude toward God, ask him to reveal areas in my life where I'm getting too, you know, controlling. Like I'm, I'm taking back the reins of my life and saying, God, I want you to be this to me because that's what you are and that's what I expect instead of allowing God to be the savior I need, right? Yep. So as we worship this morning, let's take some time just to think about, you know, our relationship with God. Let's, let's adore him. Let's just take time and just let him know how much we adore him, how much we love him, how much he means to us. And let's let him reveal himself to our, us again, like today. Like, I, I want to know God more all the time. So I want you to, too. So let's pray. Lord, we come this morning, we're so thankful to you for who you are. Lord, we're so thankful for what you've done in our lives. We're so thankful to you, Lord, for, Lord, the, the many um, things that you've done, Lord, to to lead us, and guide us, and protect us. Lord, even in this past year as a church, Lord, you've kept us, and you've, you've saved us, Lord, and, we're, and we just, Lord, are so thankful. Lord, if this morning I just come with a heart that's hungry for you, Lord, we do. We just say, Lord, have your way in us. Lord, have, have your way in us. Lord, speak to our hearts today, because we need you. We need you so much. So, Lord, also, Lord, I just pray, Lord, this morning for Ziggy, Lord, you would just touch his body. Lord, I just thank you that, Lord, you're doing a great work in him and that you'll continue to do that great work. And Lord, you'll finish that work. And Lord, you'll just sort of, Lord, just touch him in many mighty and powerful ways. Lord, just pray for Lord, each person this morning that's struggling. Lord, if there's, yeah. Lord, if there's those that are sick, those that are, are Lord, struggling with, uh, you know, anxiety, depression. Lord, we just come in Jesus' name. We just thank you, Lord, that your peace that passes understanding will rule reign in their hearts, Lord. I just thank you that deep peace will settle on the inside of them, and that they'll be strengthened in the inner man, in Jesus' name. And we just want to just, Lord, just say, enjoy our worship this morning, Lord. We're doing it for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.
There's no shadow you won't light up 
Like I, I just like I really feel like that this has been like a tough, tough year for everybody. But like I think that if you would listen to what God's saying, He wants to reveal Himself in the middle of your trouble, in the middle of the struggle, in the middle. Like I was thinking about this, you know, we're going to talk about it. Maybe I should just wait until I get there in the message. But like the contrast between dark and light is so awesome. Like, you know, when you see, like, you know, if, you, if you're, like, you know, I get up early in the morning, and our house is dark, and I go into the washroom and flip the light on, and it almost burns my retinas out, because the contrast is so great. Well, I think this is a year where the contrast between what's happening as far as the world is in darkness, and the way things are going, and what God wants to do in the world, it can be that startling of a contrast. But we just... We just got to keep ourselves ready. We got to keep ourselves, you know, up. We got to keep ourselves connected to Him, and we got to keep ourselves obedient to Him, so we can, you know, share the good news of Jesus every chance we get. It's good news. It's awesome. So next Sunday or next Friday morning, this coming Friday, we're having our Good Friday service at ten o'clock in the morning, and then we'll have Easter Sunday on Sunday, and uh, we're we're getting ready, setting up to be outside most of the summer. I know it's like, it's it's challenging, but we have shade. So those of you that are worried about, you know, not wanting to be in the sun, we'll have shade. And for those of you that like the sun, you'll be able to sit in the sun and we can be able to sing out loud and worship the Lord with all our heart. And it's kind of fun. Like last year we had a lot of visitors that I got to go with all these new people and still talk to some of them once in a while. And I just, I'm thankful. But we just really want the church to be as abnormal normal as it can be, right? Like, so being outside has been abnormal for us. But, like, we're going to lengthen out our worship services again and be able to really just worship the Lord. And we're going we're gonna to figure out how we're going to do kids' ministry outdoors or maybe indoors or however. We're going to figure it all out. But we can use your prayers. And also, like, start thinking about who you can invite. Because I found this last year. People are more willing to come. When it's a different setting, right? A lot of people actually think the walls and the ceiling will come down on them if they darken the door of the church. And I always tell them, like, we built it good, like it's it'll it'll last, right? But like just just start thinking about who you can invite. So Palm Sundays, happy Palm Sunday. Like that was a special day, right? Like people, like Jesus was coming in to town. And it was like he's been in town many times, and he always has a crowd, but Never a crowd like that day. Like, not, not as crazy a crowd. Like, these people were, they were going crazy. Like, I mean, if you've looked around the world, you see some of the protests going on. You see, like, people are in the streets, they got signs, and they're yelling, and they're screaming, and they're doing stuff they never think about doing. Like, I remember when I used to work in a union shop, and there was this guy who was, like, the calmest person ever. And then it came to a strike, and he was like a total savage, you know? And it was like that, I think, with people that day. Like, people that, like, were always calm, always normal, always kind of low-key. All of a sudden, they lost their mind. Because, like, so many things happened that day that made them think and understand Scripture from the past that keyed them into the fact that Jesus just might be the Messiah. And actually, they took a big risk and banked on the fact that he was. And he was. It just didn't look the way they thought it was going to look. And I think like a lot of times as believers, we, we are, we're talking to God about stuff, we're, we're asking God for stuff, and we're, we're wanting things a certain way. And, and sometimes, like, Jesus is coming into town, and we're excited because, okay, all the things that I've dreamed about, all the things I wanted, finally I'm going to have it. And then it turns out different than we thought, but we find out later that it was better than we thought. Like, I think about Palm Sunday, and it was like a revolution, really. Like, the people were going to set him up as king, and they were going to fight the Roman army, and this was going to be a, the beginning of a battle. Like, this is what it was going to be. And if that's what it would have been, and it had succeeded, maybe we would still hear about it today. But maybe not. Maybe it would have just been a blip on the screen of history because it wasn't what God wanted. It wasn't what God planned, right? But because of what Jesus did that day, because of how Jesus came in, right, that day, it changed history. Like, I think about, like, 
I know their power of like, you know, multiply. Like I've seen it in, in life. But like when you think about what's happened since that day when, you know, the Holy Spirit fell in the upper room, you know, till this day, we went from 120 people. So like, probably like about, you know, another 40% of what we have here. This was the church in the beginning. Like a little bit bigger, you know? And now, it's two and a half billion people strong and growing every day. Growing every day. Christianity has changed the world. Christianity has given the world hospitals and prisons and all these things that are humane. Like it's done so much for the world. I know we get a bad rap, we're closed-minded, we're bigots, we're this, we're that, which is all a big pack of lies. It's not true, right? But, but we've changed the world because of the power of what Jesus started that day. What he, what he set in motion that day changed the whole world. So Palm Sunday is not just any old day of the week. Palm Sunday is like a day for us to really just understand what the scriptures would have us no, um, it's a reminder about all the good that can happen and all the bad that can happen in our perception of what God is doing in the world and our awareness about what's going on. I, I, I want you to ask this question kind of at the beginning of the sermon, sermon this morning. It's like, who have you tried to make God to be? I know that sounds like a really kind of crass question, but I think in a lot of people's hearts, even though they might not think about it that way, you have an expectation of God and what you think he should be and what he should do for you and what, what that is. But I think that like God has so much more. Like when Alyssa said that this morning about, you know, it was still a day of victory. It kind of tweaked in my head. Like it was like the greatest day of it. Everything was falling in place exactly as planned. It was like, it didn't look like they were winning, but they won, right? He, God won, he wins, he, we, we win, you know, like the old song, we win, we win, hallelujah, we win. I read the back of the book and we win, we do win, we won. We've already won. I know nobody knows that song anymore, you're all, like I was, I was like, uh, yeah, Heather knows it, Ed Bob like but like there's like there's like so much that happened in this week that we're heading into that's so powerful. So I want to read you the, the Bible, you know, about that day. So Matthew chapter 21, verse 1, and I'm gonna to go to verse 11. It says, When they came near Jerusalem and had reached Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples ahead of him. He said to them, Go into the village ahead of you. You will find a donkey tied there and a colt with it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them. That person will send them at once. This, this happened so that the prophet, what the prophet had said came true. Tell the people of Zion, your king is coming to you. He's gentle, riding on a donkey, on a colt, a young Pack in. The disciples did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their coats on them for Jesus to sit on. Most of the people spread their coats on the road. Others cut branches from their trees and spread them out on the road. The crowd that went ahead of him and that followed him was shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. When they said those, that phrase, Hosanna, we're going to talk about what that means, but to the son of David. They were talking. This was a direct reference to the Messiah. So like this was going to be the savior of Israel. They looked for him for like thousands of years. They've been waiting. They've been studying just like, like I do. I don't know about you guys. I love just thinking about the end days when Jesus is going to return. I love it. And I think about it a lot. But these scholars had studied this and studied it and studied it and studied it. And here... This was all coming about, right? They were saying, Hosanna, blessed is he, son of David, who comes in the name of the Lord. So, uh, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus came into Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar. People were asking, who is this? And the crowd answered, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. This, this scripture has a couple of prophetic verses in it 
from the Old Testament that made the promise of the coming Messiah and God's delivered God's deliverance for his people. So as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, there's some lessons we can learn as we live in these challenging days that we're in. So the first, number one, the kingdom of God has come. It's not coming, it's come. The Bible said the kingdom of God is among us. Jesus came to establish his kingdom. That day two millennia ago kicked off what we call Holy Week today. And Jesus entered Jerusalem to, to follow the path that was laid out for him by his father. Like, it's awesome. Like, I mean, I love my dad. I thought he was great. But, like, I, I think about the obedience of Jesus and what he did. Like, if my dad asked me to do a job that was a little bit too hard, I stalled. I, I didn't, you know, sometimes I didn't even do it. Like, I didn't want to do it. It's too hard. Like, what are you asking me? Right? But Jesus was, like, willing and obedient. And don't think that he didn't know what he was coming to. Actually, everybody that day knew what was coming to them. Everybody knew what Rome did when you tried to exalt another as king. Like, they knew. So, but Jesus knew. When he went there, he was, he was following God, and, his, and he wanted to bring deliverance to his people. So, as Jesus comes, um, that, anyway, I just got a little ahead of myself there. Um, so, he was following the plan laid out for him by his father in order to pay the price for our redemption and to establish his kingdom on earth. Unlike the people of, of uh, you know, that day, we have the luxury of hindsight. I have a really good joke about that, but my kids will grow into my tell, so I'm not going to tell. Um, hindsight. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing. Um, and we see the completed work of Jesus on Calvary's cross. We see it. We've already, we already know. Like, I don't want to embarrass anybody. But like, if Jesus has really changed your life, just put up your hand. Like, he's changed mine so much. Like, he's so powerful. Right? So we see that. The power of what Jesus came to do is not diminished because of the time that's passed. He came to deal a blow to sin and death and to set us free and open the doors for relationship to him. Like, that's awesome. We don't deserve it. Like, I, like I'm like i not even saying because of our sin. Like, if I want to go meet Queen Elizabeth today, and I don't really care about the Queen, right? But if I really cared about the Queen, and some people do, and, and, and they got to meet the Queen today, they'd be like off the rockers. They'd be going crazy. They'd be like, I get to meet the Queen. This is so good. Right? Well, we get to have a relationship with God. We get to live in his presence. We get to know that one day we're going to look at his face face to face and we're going to spend eternity with him. Like, not just a quick royal visit with like, bye, or, you know, whatever they do. I don't know. Like, I'm not a, I'm not a royal follower, but it's pretty, you know, it's pretty, like, structured and this and that. But God's called us and set us a relationship in front of us. This was what Israel had been looking for and longing for for thousands of years. Now it had happened. They were so excited, but the excitement was really short-lived because six days later, that same crowd was yelling, crucify him. They were yelling, kill him. Like, kill him. Like, crucify Like, crucify him. Like, I don't even... The Passion of the Christ, I don't know if any of you guys saw that movie. That was hard. To watch, like it was awful. And these people were not unfamiliar with crucifixions. They were like sick. These people were crazy. Like they were yelling, crucify him. Like hang him on a cross. Kill him the worst possible way. And these were the same people that were like, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in. Hosanna, Hosanna. You know, like, right? These people were crazy. And this is the way we are sometimes. We're so excited about God one day, and the next day we're all mad at him because he didn't do exactly what we thought he was going to do. I just, I just want to just bring things into perspective, people. Like, I'm not, say, I'm not saying blanket statement everybody's going, but we all have been through this. Like, one day he's all, well, we Lord Jesus, I love you. And the next day it's like, well, why did you do this? I don't know. I'm just saying. Like, we got to think. 
They were so excited, but the excitement was short-lived. The same crowd wanted him as a Messiah, now shouting, crucify him. How many times do we as believers have that same attitude? We face the same problem as the people on that day did. Because we really thought he would be the Savior we wanted instead of the Savior we needed. Like, let that sink in. Like, I, I can tell you some prayers I've prayed in the past. That I was like, God, you have to do this for me or I'm not going to make it. And thank God that he was the Savior I needed, not the one I wanted. Because if I got what I wanted, it wouldn't be good. It wouldn't have been good. So, we put so much stock in this present world. We do. We, we put so much stock in, like, our stuff and our careers, and our image, and our, our kids, and what they make us look like. And really, that all burns up. I mean, like, as we draw closer to the end, like, we gotta realize how much this stuff does not matter at all. Like, it doesn't matter. But like, we think about like, and, and, and it's normal, we should think about like, how am I gonna pay my bills? How am I gonna feed my kids? How am I gonna, how am I gonna? Jesus said this, you know, when he was walking the earth, he said, like, consider the lilies of the field. Solomon in all his glory was not dressed like them. Consider the birds of the air, even though they don't toil or, 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 or struggle, they have food, right? And he said he'd take care of us in that way. But so many times we're so worried that he's not going to, and we just, we just get all like, it's like hoard and grab you know, all this stuff, and it's really not what God wanted. We love the things of this world so much, we want an immediate change, immediate, instead of letting God change things from the inside out. Like, so much about our life has to start inside. Like, because, like, you know, like, we do so many stupid things, like, honestly. Like, so... You get in a fight with your spouse. It's the same fight you have all the time because you're like, you got a bad attitude, you're kind of lazy, you know, you always want your own way, and then you butt heads. And then you say, God, God, save my marriage, right? And then God's like, well, I'm trying, right? But like, you got to do something. You got to like do your part. You got to go to like marriage small group and learn about the crazy cycle and the other cycle. It's like, you got you to gotta like, you got to let God come in and help, but you got to change Inside. Inside. Like that's what happens to us when we give our hearts to Jesus and we start to pursue him. It changes us from the inside out. It, it changes us the way we think. It changes us in the way we react. It changes everything about us if we allow it. If we get into God's word, if we allow God's word to be truth and life to us, we will change from the inside out. And these people, though, they want it immediately. They want it now. And do it now. And if you don't do it now, crucify it. Well, how many of us are like that? The people were so excited because they knew that the scripture in Zechariah proclaimed what they were seeing. And this is what it says, Zechariah 9.9. 9, Rejoice with all your heart, people of Zion. Shout in triumph, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He's righteous and victorious. He's humble and rides on a donkey, on a colt, a young pack animal. And they showed out Hosanna to the son of David, which means to save us now. Hosanna means save us now. Save us now. Like they were, oh, they were like, they were in a bad spot. And they were yelling out, save us now. Son of David, right? Messiah, save us. Which means to save us now, which was pointing to Jesus as their Messiah. The problem is, and this is point number two. The kingdom's coming doesn't always look the way we think it will. That day that they were in, the Jews lived under horrific, like Roman rule. Like Rome was a was an iron-fisted um, government. They were like they were like demanding respect. Like even saying something like "Lord," call it Jesus, the one who is come in the name of the Lord. In Roman culture, the only one that was Lord was Caesar. 
And when you said someone else was Lord, like that's treason. It was treason. So they're they're living under this heavy oppression. And, and remember when, when Herod got wind that Jesus was born and there was a king born to the Jews when the wise men came and, and they said, we're seeking this, this king that was born. And he killed like every kid under two, every boy under two, he killed them. Like we just saw last week in a fire in, in Montreal, I think the little two boys, little boys got killed. And that's like awful to think about. We've seen young children die. But a whole generation of children were killed, and not by some psycho running around with a gun. No, this was the government killed. And every, every family in Israel had to be touched by that. Every family in Israel had to know what it was like to be under that kind of like oppression and rule, right? The children killed by Herod were so young and there were thousands of them. They were killed by soldiers. The last major uprising before that was long before Pilate's time. And it had been after the death of Herod the Great in 4 BC. The uprising started in a city called Sepphoris, about five miles from Jesus' boyhood home of Nazareth. Before it was over, the city of Sepphoris, the capital of Galilee and the town of Emmaus, you know that one, right? The road to Emmaus. Um, had, had been destroyed by the Roman army. They either killed or sold 30,000 of its inhabitants. Like, this is Rome. This is what Rome was about. They were, like, cruel. So, like, for the Jews to be excited on that day, thinking their Messiah had come, was not unusual, right? Like, they were, they were wanting that. After putting down that rebellion, the Romans marched on Jerusalem. After pacifying the city, they crucified over 2,000 Jews who were accused of being part of the rebellion. The Romans had made their intolerance for rebellion well known. So when I say like they knew, right, about crucifixion, they knew. They also knew that, that Herod and, and the Roman government loved to crucify people that tried to start a rebellion. They knew this. They're throwing their coats on the road and they're like, come, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes. Right? So even on that same day as Jesus was riding into the city on the triumphal entry, history tells us that Pilate also had traveled with a contingent of Roman, Roman's fine, finest soldiers from his house at, in Caesarea by the sea, from his beach cottage. He went to the stuffy, crowded provincial city of Jews, Jerusalem. The temple would be the center of Passover activities, and Antonio's fortress um, would be, um, that was a Roman garrison built beside the temple, would serve as a good vantage point from which to keep an eye on the Jews. Pilate's entry into Jerusalem was meant to send a message to the Jews and to those who might be plotting against the Empire of Rome. The spectacle was meant to remind the Jews of what had happened the last time there was a wide-scale uprising, and it was meant to intimidate the citizens of Jerusalem themselves, who might think twice about joining such a rebellion if it was already slated to fail. The Jews saw Jesus and his popularity as their way out from under Roman oppression. Like they wanted out. And I don't blame them. I would have wanted out too. Like sometimes we complain about our Canadian government, you know, like they're putting screws to us. And yeah, 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 whatever. Like, but like when we think about what Rome was like, like it was awful. And we cry out, save us now, right? But, but like, these people had a reason to cry out, save us now. So, on one end of the city, right, Jesus is coming in the city as a triumph, in his triumphal entry, riding on a, on a colt of a donkey. Like, he didn't even ride the donkey, he rode the colt of the donkey. On the other end of the city, Pilate is, is riding in, on the tallest horse they could find. Like if you were king, you had the tallest horse. If you were the next in command, you're so they rode in on these on these military like stallion steeds. They were huge horses because it signified their power and their strength and their ability for battle. And and so they're riding in to intimidate everything that was going to happen there that day. They didn't know this was going to happen. But Jesus on the other end of the city, right? 
He's riding in on the smallest animal that he could ride on. And the Bible said he was lowly and humble and riding on the colt of a donkey. Like Jesus was coming in humility and Rome was coming in with power. If Pilate's procession was meant as a show of military might and strength, Jesus' procession was meant to show the opposite. He rode in on a donkey, a colt of a donkey. And this is, again, we, we read the scripture, but I'm going to read it again. Right? Because this was a clear fulfillment of prophecy. It said in Zechariah 9, 9, Shout and cheer, daughter Zion. Raise the roof, daughter Jerusalem. Your king is coming. A good king who makes all things right. A humble king riding on a donkey. A mere colt of a donkey. So there's more to this passage than just a description of Jesus' means of transportation for that day. The prophet Zechariah is speaking to the nation in Zechariah 9. And the prophet reassures the people of Jerusalem, called Judeans at the time on the New, in the New Testament, that God was not, has not forgotten. And this is what goes on. So, I will set up my camp. This is verse 8 of Zechariah chapter 9. I will set up my camp in my home country, and I will defend it against invaders. Nobody is going to hurt my people ever again. I'm going to keep my eye on them. Shout and cheer, daughter of Zion. Raise the roof, daughter of Jerusalem. Your king is coming. A good king who makes all things right. A humble king riding on a donkey. A mere skull of a donkey. I've had it with war. No more chariots in Ephraim. No more war horses in Jerusalem. No more swords and spears, bows and arrows. He will offer peace to the nations, a peaceful rule worldwide from the four winds to the seven seas. In other words, Jesus quote from the, or Jesus fulfilling the quote from the prophet Zechariah reminded those who heard him of the entire passage. The message they heard was, God will deliver the nation from the oppressor, Rome. But the king they seek will come humbly to them. Not on a steed of war, but on a slow-moving donkey. The symbol of a king who comes in peace, according to Zechariah. They were looking for a king that would come in war. And Jesus came in peace. They were persuaded that when the Messiah came, it would be to reestablish the throne of David and to rule the nation in peace forever. So on that day, they wanted what they wanted from him was different than what was planned by God. Aren't you thankful? Like I am. I know it does. It seems like anticlimactic, and I get like I, I can understand why they thought it was going to be good, and it wasn't. And then they were mad because he didn't do what he said. Or what they thought he said. Like they were mad. He'd been crucified. But like they had this expectation. It's what, it's what they had always believed would happen. But something far better was getting ready to happen. Something that would save them for eternity and not just from for their lifetime. Something that would change the world from the inside out. And I know the world's not perfect today. But the world has the church today, and the world has Jesus displaying himself through the church today. And there's hope today, and there wasn't hope then. There's, there's, there's chance for us now because of Jesus. So they were looking for a king like David, someone that would be fair and make their lives better, a king that would be good to the common man and create a kingdom that was built on brotherhood and equality, just like Camelot. Right? Like that, was, that was kind of like what Camelot was built the same way. But that's what they thought was going to happen that day. A king that would so love God that he, he could do not, not do anything but love his people. They were tired of being ruled over by foreign kings and being taxed heavily and being treated badly. Jesus, though, did not come to set up an earthly kingdom. He came to bring the kingdom of God to earth, to change it from the inside out, to really bring about his way and his will with people, to invite us into a relationship with him. Sometimes, you know, like we think the greatest thing about the gospel is that we're saved, and it is. Like, but when that also what he brought to us is the relationship with him, and so many of us 
Like, don't engage in that with him. So many of us don't even talk to him. Like, we close our, our phones, I guess, not even our Bibles anymore, but we close our Bibles when we leave church, and we never look at him again for the week. Or we don't, we don't really... We don't really bring him into our everyday life, but that was like the greatest blessing that he gave us, that we could spend life with him here on earth, and then we could spend eternity with him in heaven. He came to break the power of sin and not the back of Roman rule in Israel. He came to heal the heart issues so that all men can live, live free from sin, even the Romans. Like he came to save the Romans too. Like remember... Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then right away, Romans. Like, he, he was dealing with the Romans, too. He loved them, too. Even though, like, that's a mind-blowing thing, isn't it? Like, the people that crucified him, his own people, his own religious leaders, the ones he sat in front of probably when he was like a kid, you know, they're his uh, Christian school teachers, right? Like, they were all of a sudden, like, they were plotting to kill him. And then they actually killed him. And they're looking up at him and sneering, and he's looking down at them going, Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they did. Like, they don't know. Like, Jesus was an awesome. And he came to change things from the inside out. And he did. He did change. He still comes humbly today. Like, you know what? People ask me all the time, well, if God's so good, why didn't he just save everybody? Well, he wants to. Why does he stands at the door of your heart and he knocks? He comes humbly. Right? He comes and says, let me in, please. I want to I wanna have dinner. I want to I wanna have a relationship with you. He still comes humbly. Even like when we're all scurrying around, worried about everything, and pushy, pushy, bang, bang, like, God, oh God, I don't have enough, I want more. And Jesus is standing there and he's humbly waiting and saying, tried everything else. What about me? I got here for you. I got to do that so many times, you know, as a pastor. Like, I, I, I had, like, so many young people go through my life as a youth pastor. And I'm still in a relationship with a lot of them. And I say to them, like, if you need anything, just call. You know, but they don't call until there's, like, wreck. Like, there's so much hurt and brokenness in their life. And they, I'm like, call. Like, and I'm like, but I can't knock the door down. Jesus can't won't knock the door down in your life. He won't force you. Like, you know, so he, he wants to work in your life and he wants to work in your heart, but he comes humbly. Just like he came that day. He didn't make the big fanfare of himself. He just did what he asked, what the Father told him to do, and he fell in line with what the Father wanted him to do. Third point, last point for this morning, is you might miss his coming if you're looking for the wrong thing. The people of that day missed him, even though they were celebrating because uh, they were celebrating because he when he oh, sorry because when he wasn't what he thought what they thought he was when when he didn't when he didn't help them the way they thought he would when he didn't set himself up as ruler right they were upset with him but he didn't come for that he came to be crucified and they yelled crucify him. Like, they yelled, crucify him. And he knew they would. Like, I believe he knew they would. I believe that night in the garden, when he, when he wept, when he sweated tears of blood, when he said to his father, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Like, I can take a lot. You know, I'd do a lot for anybody. But when, when I get betrayed, I don't think there's anything that hurts more than that. When I did something to someone for their good, and they took it as, as me trying to control them or hurt them, like that hurts me deeply. Well, Jesus was human, like he came in human form. And everybody that he loved, even his own disciples, turned their back on him. Like he was, he knew that. But he walked straight toward the cross. Like I'm always amazed, like he knew, he knew, he knew that this day was gonna set in motion a week for him, that was going to be awesome and victorious. Like, it doesn't look that way when, when we look at it in our human mind, but, but God's plan was being played out. It was awful for him to go through it, but it was the plan. 
and he gave his life. I think about like, so what if he would have fought that day? What if he would have set himself up for earthly rule that day? Thousands and thousands and thousands of people would have died. Instead, he just walked. He just did what he did. He was who he was supposed to be. He died alone on a cross, even separated from his own father because of sin that we put on him, that he took on him, his self for us. He became alone, a solitary figure. Instead of thousands dying, one died for a thousand, for millions, for billions now. Like Jesus is so awesome. Like we, we have to see how awesome he is, but we have to see that he came to change the sin issue in our life more than anything else. Like he came to heal you, set you free, provide for you. Like it's all there in the atonement, but the most important thing for us is that he came to set us right with God. That was what was happening that day. There was nothing else on his mind but to walk down this road until he was crucified. That day, you know, there was the people that were confused about who he was. But then there was the Jewish religious leaders who missed him. They missed him completely. And I believe that they missed him because they were so busy controlling and manipulating events that they misinterpreted the heart of God for the people. Like anybody that thinks that a political movement will change the world is crazy. Like, honestly, crazy. Like, it'll never change the world. Like, I like politics. But I don't care if you have a conservative government, a liberal government, an NDP government. None of that's going to make us moral. And I even would say this, as the church, many times, like, we, we don't live out what God's called us to live out. And to think that we can change the world without Jesus is crazy. Like, we don't have the world. Like, Left to our own devices, we're we're doing stupid things all the time. Like we want our own way, we want to have our own, we want our own win. We want to we want to like manipulate, and twist people. But with Jesus, He makes us holy, right? Like we should never look to a world system to save us. Like don't matter, not Trudeau, not Ford, not Trump, whatever. Like none of that. We look to Jesus because He's the one who really changes us from the inside out. Like, glory to glory, faith to faith, line upon line, precept upon precept. It's a, it's a journey, it's a process, it's not like happening in one day. Sorry, like if you, if you thought everything was gonna go from being like that, being like that, it didn't, it doesn't happen. Like you gotta change from the inside. Like your heart changes like that. You go from being dead to being alive, but like all your way of thinking and all that, it's got to be worked through. God's got to work in you and change you from the inside out. That day, those Jewish religious leaders were wondering what the noise was in the street when the one that they were supposed to celebrate went by. Like I always, that that thought always just like makes me crazy. Like they've been seeking him. Like I seek the coming of the Lord. I do. I don't care. I'm 56 years old. If the trumpet sounds tomorrow, like I have no regrets. I'm leaving this planet. I'm going to be with Jesus. Thank God. Praise Jesus. I want to be with him. Like that's my heart. And there's going to come a day down the road. It's not at 56, but if Jesus doesn't return for everybody, he's going to return for me. And I'm looking forward to that day. I'm not going to face it with fear. I love him. I'm crazy about him. I think he's awesome. But like, so these people were waiting for him. Thousands of years they studied. Oh, pre-trib, mid-trib, after-trib, like all millennial, pan-millennial, all their different doctrines and their different sides and every and, and here he was, like the one they studied about and hoped for all these years, walking by in the street and they're like, "What's the noise out there?" Like, do you think we could be like that sometimes? Like that we're just like we're praying, "Oh God, touch my heart." God's just like. I want to just just be quiet like just just listen just pay attention the disciples those gathered you know after the crucifixion like they were they were they were confused too like they were heartbroken 
They love Jesus. They, they've given up everything to follow Jesus. Like these, these disciples were business guys. They walked away from their business and they went to follow Jesus. They followed him for three years. He, he told them stuff that they were sure meant he was the Messiah. And they were sure that they understood what he was going to do. Even though, like, right before he died, he goes, I'm like, this is my body, this is my blood. you got to eat my body, you got to drink my blood. And he's, they're like, what? But, like, they were confused. And they were lost. Right? But God was faithful. And revealed himself, revealed Jesus to them in groups, some of them, individuals, some of them. Like, I think, like, some of these, you know, like, I always think about Peter, right? Peter denied Jesus three times. Go tell the disciples, and especially Peter, that I'm risen, right? Like, whatever you need, he wants to come to you. Like, he comes. Like, the kingdom of God has come, and it's for you. And it's not, it's not trying to get away from you. It's trying to knock, 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 let me in, right? Like, he wants to be in a relationship with the least likely, these people that were gathered around Jesus were like, they weren't like great people. Like they weren't like people that, you know, most likely likely to succeed in high school. Like they weren't. They were just average, ordinary people, and they shook the world. Like they shook it. Two and a half billion strong. Two thousand years later, the message is stronger today than it's ever been. Like because of what God did through those early disciples. I love I love, I love the story of the road to Emmaus. When they thought everything was over, and Jesus said, no, 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 it's not over. It's not over. It's just beginning. And some of you are here this morning, you're like, ah, it's over. Like, I tried so hard, I'm so tired. Like, the death counts, uh, 3,000 people in COVID again, they're gonna lock us down, right? Like, my family were stressed out. I don't know if I'm going to have a job next year, all this kind of stuff. And Jesus is like, hey, like, walk with me. I just want to tell you it's not over. It's just beginning. I'm with you. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. What about you? You all caught up because you were suffering and you wanted Jesus to fix your life in a moment, and when things didn't go exactly as you planned, you pulled back from your relationship and your adoration of him. And I'm not saying by any means that God won't fix your life, because he has so many times, even for me. Like, I think about the times when God rescued me. Like, he saved me from a pit. Like, he helped me so much. But I'm just telling you, my, my love and my relationship with him can't be dependent on that. It's got to be dependent on my love and relationship with him. Like, I can't, if, if I, like, came and told one of you guys, or all of you guys, that, like, well, Christine, she is, like, exactly what I expected her to be. Like, I thought she'd be, like, better at this and that. And so because she isn't, like, I'm just kind of, like, ticked at her. You'd all be going, like, what kind of an idiot are you? Like, shut up, right? But so many times we're like that with God. Like, my relationship with her... Like, she's older than when we met. Still beautiful, still wonderful. But like, my love for her, and when I look at her, she's every bit as beautiful as she was when she walked down the aisle. Right? I love her more today. Not because everything's gone right for us, because it hasn't. We've had lots of stuff that we've been through. Lots of struggle. Lots of pain. Right? But, I love her, because we have a relationship. I trust her. She's proven her trust. Like she, We have that. And that's what God wants to be with you. He wants to actually have a relationship with you that's not based on what have you done for me lately, but it's based on just love and adoration. Mutual, really, because he loves you and admires you too. Like he didn't leave you on the cold. Oh, I've talked a long time today. So are you like, um, are you like that? Like that you just... Like the people, or you like the religious leaders of the day, and your heart is so turned toward money and influence that you just can't see past that for a hunger for God and a relationship with God? Or you're like the disciples that struggle with some of the things that they hoped for didn't really seem to be panning out. 
and their world ended when Jesus breathed his last. If that's you, then the good news is that Jesus is always coming. He is always coming to restore that which is broken to to hold you and to love you and to care for you. He loves you. He's so happy. So this morning, I just like my my heart heart's prayer is that we strip down some of the stuff that we carry. Like if you gotta, if you're the person who's always got to be in charge, you've always got to manipulate the situation because you're insecure or you're worried or you're fearful. Like just drop it today. Just just lay it down and say, God, I just want you. I just want you. I want to know you for what you really are. If you're a person today that just like has has to, everything has to be based on what you have you done for me lately. Like just just say, God, I trust you. I just I just trust you. I'm gonna trust you with the rest of my life. And even if I end up in eternity and I didn't get everything I wanted on earth, I'm gonna still trust you because I love you. I love you and I want you. And if you're a person here today that's just like, oh, like I thought, I thought this was gonna happen and it didn't, and I'm heartbroken. And I just want Jesus anyway. Like, yeah, he's here for you. I'm just telling you, he's here. Palm Sunday is an awesome day. Because it didn't end on Palm Sunday, it just started. Like, we're going to go to Good Friday coming up. And this Good Friday, we're going to talk about Easter. Because, like, there's some cool things about Easter that we're going to look at on Good Friday. to look forward to Easter. But, like, Easter and Good Friday. Good Friday was a sad day, like it seemed. But it was like the climax of a battle that had been going on for ages. And this was the winning blow. This was the, this was the death knell for Satan and his host. This was like the end of their rule and their reign of terror and separation from God. Like this was it. And so God, you know, bless us. Bless you guys. Lord, I just, Lord, I hope I, I got across what you wanted to say today. Lord, I pray that as a church, Lord, we'll love you with pure hearts. Lord, that we'll give you our best and our first. Lord, that our lives be lives that reflect your nature so people that are lost in darkness can see you. Lord, let them see your goodness and your glory through our lives. Lord, let us let them see your humility through our humility. Let them see your love through our love for them. Lord, help us again to re reconnect with you, to stay connected to you, to Lord, just to be in a living and vibrant relationship with you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for all that it means. I ask you, Lord, bless your people as we leave this place. Lord, keep them. Strengthen them. Lord, let, let your face never turn away from us as you promise. I'll never turn my face away from you. Lord, and, and give them rest and give them peace. Lord, again, Lord, I just, I just pray for peace to flow across this region. I pray in the name of Jesus, the most mighty, powerful, beautiful name in the universe. Amen. Amen. Have a great day, everyone. God bless you.